everybody. It's Simon Majumda here, presenting one of my favorite people on Eat My Globe, a podcast that tells you everything you didn't know you didn't know about food. And on today's very special episode, we are delighted to introduce Mimi A., author of both Mandalay, Recipes and Tales from a Burmese Kitchen, and Noodles, both of which are necessary for your own kitchen. Although Mimi and I have not met, I don't think we have, I am thrilled and really pleased that she has taken time to be with us from her work uh, to talk about her passions of how food could be used against life-threatening situations. These would include the horrors we see now in her beloved Burma, Myanmar, to those we might see in India, my own love, in Ukraine, and even here in the United States. And as well as that, I know that Mimi will talk to us about her passion for the food of Myanmar and the origins of where that food came from. It's my really great pleasure to introduce you to the one and only Mimi Ai. Hello. Hi. It's very lovely to be here, Simon. I know. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm so pleased that you're here because I've been trying to find a reason to get you on. And now, now we have it. Oh, it's very easy. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a cheap date, so you can get me on at any time. Um, but it's funny, you know, you said that we, we haven't met in real life, but I think we've known each other for about 15 years, just because yes. we've we've been haunting the online forums of food for such a long time. So. I, I know, it's, it's one of those crazy things that we've never, ever actually met, and yet we do know each other pretty kind we of do. intimately through Twitter. That's um, this. You became a, a celebrity abroad, though, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about celebrity, but I am abroad. First of all, though, thank you, thank you for, uh, for taking the time from your very busy schedule to come and join us on the Eat My Globe podcast. Um, and before we go into the kind of subjects um, that we have you know, to cover from you, tell us a bit about who you are uh, and uh, about your kind of knowledge of you know, Burma and Myanmar and Burmese food. Uh, so let's let's kind of talk about that first, and then let's look at Burmese food before we go into talking about food as protest. Okay, brilliant. So, um, like you say, I am a primarily a food writer with occasional forays into politics and culture. Um, <laughs> my, my parents and my brothers emigrated to the UK from Burma uh, just before I was born. My mum was pregnant with me, so I was a stowaway. Um, but like di diaspora from many countries, they always hoped that they would return to Myanmar. Um, I think they still do, even though they're in their 70s. Um, and especially because like the rest of our family was are still there, even now. Um, so they made sure to kind of teach me how to speak Burmese. They taught us about the culture. They reared us on Burmese food to the extent that like, School dinners, I probably liked them more than anyone else because they were they were foreign to me, you know, because at home we only ate Burmese food. <laughs> so, so you know, having like apple crumble or gypsy tart or, you know, all that kind of stuff, which is quite thrilling, you know, that, that was exotica to me. Um, so, um, and then, you know, as children and growing up, we would stay, we stayed in touch with um, our family. So we'd, we'd, you know, we'd call them, we'd write to them. And then as soon as my parents could afford it, um, we, we went to, to Burma, to Myanmar. So like every summer, that's where I would be. I'd be like staying with my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and cousins. And so I'm kind of, I guess I'm sort of a third culture kid in that respect. So, you know, my heart is in two places, definitely. I mean, I, I feel the same because I'm kind of half in India, half in, well, Wales, which my uh, mother was, but half half in Yorkshire. And it, I mean, it's all and half in London. Well, I don't know what you get because that's too many halves, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Uh, and so I totally accept that. And, and that's how I felt, particularly about India. So I feel that. But before we go on, and I, I think this actually does uh, go into India, but let's let's talk about Burmese food because a lot of people don't know it. Um, they don't know kind of the indigenous or the Indian aspect or Chinese or all of this. So let's let's talk about this because I think people really want to know about this. And we have a huge Eat My Globe audience and they and they really are, you know, kind of food, food people. So let's get them uh, excited about this. I went to Burma with my wife the day before Suchi was actually uh, nominated and became so that was a big time and it was a mm. big thing and on all the papers and everything um, and we enjoyed our time there and we went everywhere um, 
and so it became very special to us because my my parents used to go from Burma uh, from India to there and they had a home there it was it was a big wow. thing so yeah so um talk to me about first of all let's talk about the indigenous food in yes. Burma and uh, and what's so special about that because it it is and w- the way you talk about it in your food is just so special Oh, thank you. Um, so, okay. So, first of all, let's 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 do a little bit of kind of a, a background. So, Myanmar has fifty four, fifty five million people population, um, and we've got one hundred and thirty plus ethnic groups. They've yeah. each got their own cuisines. They've each got their own kind of dress, language, culture. And so, I'm going to tell you right from the start that it would be foolhardy and arrogant yes. of me <laughs> to try to speak for the whole country. Um, and it's also quite common for people to be a mix of those ethnicities. So like me personally, I'm actually a mix of four different ethnic groups, um, about a quarter each. So I'm Burma, which is like the majority. I think that's something like 70 percent of the country. Yeah. Um, and then I'm Shan, which is the second biggest ethnic group, but only about 10 percent, I think, as in 10 percent of the country. Um, and then I'm in there, which is kind of they're, they're like boat people I suppose they live around a lake and the lake is called Inlay so Indar means the sons of Inlay Lake um, and then I'm a, a kind of like a renegade quarter Yunnanese so there's there's Chinese in me um, and kind of that you know the, 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 we'll talk about that a bit more later about how like the melding of the borders and how you know things move around but basically because of the mix I am I personally um, am kind of focused on upper Myanmar upper Burma food so that is kind of um, not away from the coastal regions towards kind of um, like Mandalay, Mogo, the Shan state. Um, and so the food that I like and eat. So, so here's, here's an example. For example, if you were in Yangon, which was the erstwhile capital, um, you would probably have a lot of cucumbers in your food because, you know, that's the crop that is kind of a very kind of, almost iconic down there and so like in your salads in your soups um you, there would be cucumbers um but as soon as you start kind of moving towards mandalay so upper Myanmar, then onions would be what features because that's the crop that's yeah. most beloved um, and so like the same salad so it would you would say it was something like i don't know pig's head salad that pig's head salad would have cucumbers as the base in yangon but they'd have um, onions as the base in mandalay um and so there isn't that much cohesion but I will say that there's probably kind of maybe three foods that I can say are, are pretty iconic of Myanmar, and you could say we're kind of properly indigenous. So the first one, and uh, this probably come as no surprise to you, uh, will be rice, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Myanmar is one of the countries who historically has been referred to as the rice bowl of Asia. I'm sure, I think India was referred to at some point. So it's it's just one of the providers. I mean, e- even now, I think it is the seventh largest provider of rice to the rest of the world, a uh, producer. Wow. Um, and apparently they have identified 2,000 different varieties of rice um, in Myanmar. Um, to the extent, I mean, I have no idea. I, apparently there's, there's one called Bo Samway, which is meant to be kind of the king of all rices and it's just meant to be super fragrant. And I think it's, it's kind of like a, a, a basmati type rice. It's very fragrant. The kind that kind of really holds its texture when you cook with it, uh, very versatile. Um, but again, you know, like a lot of countries in the region also, like when you see someone first thing, you don't say, how are you? You say, which means, have you eaten rice yet today? <laughs> so, yes. you know, it's that important, right? So rice, for sure, rice. We, we, I think we can safely say everyone in Viva <laughs> eats and loves rice. Um, the second thing I think is probably quite iconic and, and known as being quite unusual is tea and I, when i say unusual obviously the whole region of you know asia southeast asia south asia is very famous for tea production um but in myanmar um we're famous for eating eating tea because yes yes <laughs> so like our, our kind of most important kind of culturally and historically thing is something called lepet and lepet is basically pickled pickled tea leaves um and those pickled tea leaves when i say that it's kind of historically and culturally important so like historically for example you know we have like i said it's many many ethnic groups which means that there's always been warring kingdoms and what would happen is in the same way that you know you have that kind of trope of a peace pipe we would share the pickled tea 
to show that these kings huh? had decided to, you know, put their, down their weapons and oh, uh, having a truce. Yeah. Um, and then pickle tea was also shared by the two kind of um, opponents in like a court dispute in pre-colonial times. So like if, the, you know, the, the mediator arbitrator would kind of like lay down their judgment, um, if the parties that were in dispute agreed, they would share the pickle tea, the lapet. So it's kind of like symbolically very important and also kind of religiously. So, so like Myanmar is, I don't know, I think it's like 80% Buddhist. Um, and one of the kind of things that we have is that when the child's around about 11 to the age of 16, they come, a boy comes of age. So it's like a, a bar bit sort of basically. And if you are like from, you know, if you are Buddhist and you you are, you know, going to follow this this rite, this this rite of passage, what the family does is that they would go from door to door um, and present people with like an arms bowl, which would have like a little offering of this pickle tea, and that would be the formal invitation to this this ceremony. So oh. it's this is pickle tea, this lapet is just entwined in so many different ways. Um, so yes, tea would be, definitely be the second thing after rice. Um, Can I, just before we go on from tea, I'm yeah. assuming that it only came in when Robert Fortune went in and stole it from China and did, oh, and that was in the well, 1860s. So was that because he was the only one, I believe, brought it to India and Burma and everywhere else in the world? Well, I don't know the veracity of this, but, the, <laughs> you know, but there is a legend. There's always a legend um, <laughs> that in, in Myanmar, the king Alansitu, who was king in 1100s AD, he was the person who first started the locals cultivating tea in the Shan oh. state in Myanmar. So since the 1100s, allegedly, I have to have this disclaimer. <laughs> um, okay, okay. We'll, but, we'll I mean, pass we, over. Yeah. Apparently, apparently, Myanmar produces 80 million kilos of tea a year. So, you know. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I, yes, I guess when they when they eat it so much, and I definitely ate it when I was there. It was, <laughs> it was delicious. Yeah. Um, and sorry, you were going to talk, talk about the third dish, I think? Yes, the third dish. I mean, I say dish. These are all kind of ingredients, aren't they? Because, you know, it yeah. depends on who you are and how you're using it. Um, I think the third thing is probably uh, ngabi. So ngabi is... Um, I suppose you would say shrimp paste, except ours is usually made more of fish. Um, and so, yeah, basically it is it is fish paste, shrimp paste, which is either made from kind of freshwater fish because of the Irrawaddy River, which goes like all the way through the country, or there are coastal versions, which are kind of more pungent because, you know, it's coastal fish. But Nabi is something that I think most of the country indulges in to the extent that there's even like a jokey saying where they say that you can't be Burmese if you don't like Nabi and it literally runs through our veins, which is quite a pungent <laughs> thing to run through our veins. But <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and and apparently we are the people that introduced um, this paste, Finch paste, shrimp paste, to places like Cambodia, to Laos, to Thailand, to the extent that the word for the, the, the shrimp paste is kind of derived from our word. So ngabi literally means pressed fish. Um, and so in Thailand, it's called gabi. And I've actually seen um, like a British library record, um, which has like an edict from like uh, one of the, the royal kings, the, like, the Thai, Thai kings, which said that they wanted ngabi to be officially renamed gabi to distance itself from the Burmese origins. So... <laughs> oh. so. <And> that's... <laughs> That's an interesting one as well. I mean, I'm you know married to a, a Filipino person who is just, and they're popular with you know mm. the fish paste and the, and so did this just spread across that thing from there, or did they just make up something similar? No, no, I, I suspect that it just it's one of those things where things kind of develop at the same time it's a certain type of synchronicity right um and i think that's probably why for example in in some places it's very much more uh, shrimp based you know um but I, I i like i said all i know is that where stuff is called something similar to ngabi it is apparently because the burmese introduced it that way so but wow. i mean you know ngabi is, is is just like you know I, I think you mentioned to me once that you really like bala chow 
Um, oh yeah, which I absolutely love, and I make I make at home now, and it's yeah, fantastic. Exactly, and you know, and beet is like often considered an essential ingredient. Um, it'll make your house stink for a week when you've made it, um, <laughs> but you know, it's it's kind of it's just so. It's one of those things. It's a bit like you know Proust's Madeleine, right? If you get, you get a whiff of the beet, it makes you feel in this home. So. Yeah, no, I absolutely make it here. And for anyone who's uh, listening at home, Balachow, we actually have a a, a a version of it in India, and particularly in the kind of uh, west of India. Uh, and it's but it's very very different. But they call it Balachow, which mm. is very interesting that they have the same name for it, um, because they don't do a lot of paste in that way. But they do use the fish, so yeah. it's I think it's fascinating that they you know obviously near the border they've taken it across but changed it to what they do. Yeah. Um, I mean let's let's talk about um, the food that you have in uh, Burma, Myanmar. What you have from the different people who surround it as well and how that comes in because i i mean i guess to the borders have changed and all the food has changed and and how much do you think that is included i i tell the story that the best biryani i've ever had was in which is bizarre because i go to india all the time and i go to i uh, think it was in yangon and it was uh <laughs> no, it was it was absolutely I'm fantastic I am I am incredibly flattered, and also I'm surprised you haven't been tarred and feathered for for saying this by by Indian people. <laughs> oh no! Well, yeah, I I guess they know what I'm like, that I will always have an opinion. <laughs> You're it right. Was, it was, um, and it came with balachan, which was the great mm. thing. It came yes. with you know all the different sauces. We have we comes with pickles. It comes with a side salad. It comes with a soup. You know, so we eat yeah. it biryani completely differently from its origin. You know, <laughs> very very different. Um, and so that's where I talk about Indian food, but you know, you'll talk about the Chinese food, you'll talk about all of this, mm. but it is like oh, every country, it's always slightly altered. Yes. So maybe we could just, before we go on to talk about the kind of food as protests and we talk about other things, maybe we could just talk about how those foods come in oh, sure. to, and, and how they change yeah. as they come in, because I think that's a fascinating one uh, for everyone to listen to at home. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, you know, let's talk about Indian food, first of all. So, obviously, you know, there, there is a huge Indian population in the country anyway, um, but there's also been migration back and forth historically yeah. forever in a day. Um, and, of course, you know, people, they bring the food that they love with them. Um, and, you know, that, that means that even in parts of Myanmar where there aren't necessarily Indian communities, there's Indian food. Um, and the food, sometimes it's very kind of, you, you know, it, it's recognizably the same. So we really like naan, naan bread. Um, yes. And <laughs> in fact, I think most of our breads were just stolen from India. I'm just going to be very upfront about this. So <laughs> we like naan, we like um, we like parata, we like uh, chapati, we like puri. Puri uh, is like one of the, the favorite things, absolutely. So, you know, a nice alu puri. I, I, I got to the age of about 18 thinking alu puri was a Burmese thing. And then I was <laughs> disillusioned. <laughs> so, yes. so, so these yes. things, so, they, all of these things are kind of pretty much intact, right? So, you, you, you know, you would not be able to tell the difference really because it's, it's just so well loved. And, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Um, but then you have, well, that's true. But then you have the other thing where, you know, people like to tweak and obviously we see this everywhere. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that's very popular is what we call samosa dot. Now dot means salad. Um, samosa dot means a samosa salad. And, and what this is, is quite interesting. So it's kind of more or less original style samosas, although sometimes we kind of go for Chinese style spring roll pastry rather than kind of original samosa pastry. Yes, I um, yeah and then we kind of chop it up and then we kind of mix it with onions and cabbage and mint leaves and and then pour a kind of soup made of tamarind on top of it and it is you know you wouldn't know it was meant to have samosas in it. It, it's kind of i don't know i guess maybe having like learned a bit more about different types of indian food i guess it almost has similarities to something like i don't know pani puri because it's got those mm -hmm. flavors you know um okay. and then and often you'll have like a bit of masala kind of uh, sprinkled on top as well. So, you know, it's recognizably Indian, but 
I mean, I think it was in one of Madhur Jaffrey's books. So she actually said, I have seen this thing in Burma and I have no idea what it is. And they tell me that it's meant to be Indian. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. And, you know, it's always good to see, you know, kind of India uh, affect the other place in the world. And I guess obviously being so (laughs) close to it. And it was part of the British Indian territories uh, going back. So I guess that's very close. And then we look at, Obviously, the I mean, Chinese food is a vast combination, but they take it into um, Myanmar. And tell me about that, because I, yeah, you know, we tasted a lot of Chinese food, but again, it was very different. So the Chinese food we have, it's probably because I see we border Yunnan. That's the province of China that is closest to Myanmar. And yeah. as I said, I'm a quarter Yunnanese, and so I think it's just what's happened is that all of the kind of that type of Chinese food has very much just washed over the border. And like I said, even now I'm discovering new things. So like we have, um, there are rice, there's rice noodle dishes, which are called miche. um, And depending on the town you're in, it's slightly different, but basically they're like fat round rice noodles, which are basically, and I can't say this, so I'm not even gonna try, but it's the Chinese (laughs) rice noodle called M-I-X-I-A-N. Um, oh yes, okay. Uh, yes, so, I know. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. M- mix, mixian. I'll say, and then someone's going to write in and complain. But basically, uh, that's that rice noodle. But we've wholeheartedly adopted it so that it wouldn't be recognisable anymore. Um, and then another thing that we have, which um, most people are surprised by, and that's probably because they don't know about Yunnanese food, is that our tofu. We what we call tofu isn't what most of the rest of the world coast calls tofu. So most of the rest of the world is this the soybean, right? Yeah. Um, for us, it is a mixture of peas. So it's either kind of um, yellow split peas or it's chickpeas or it's um, kind of yellow, yellow peas. So is that a va- va- I don't remember what it's called. But I can't remember. Do you, you know the yellow peas, the whole yellow peas you can get that are dried? And I cannot remember what they're called for the life of me. Um, but I those don't. are the ones basically or, or gram or bezan so basically yeah. it's, it's kind of like a mixture of peas and, and what we do is that we kind of we you know grind it mix it up boil it up and then it we leave it to set and then it's you know it is a slab of what we call tofu but it's not what anyone else thinks is tofu um and that has come from yunnan because you know you just have to cross the border and you see that they're doing the exact same thing but because china is so vast I actually don't think that many people realize that's where it's come from. Um, And so a lot of people, when they eat chickpea tofu or pea tofu or, you know, this kind of gram flour tofu, they assume it was kind of spontaneously invented by the Burmese. And, you know, I've got to be honest, we got it from the Chinese, you know. Um, And so it's those kind of things where where I guess we've adopted stuff that's not necessarily that obvious, because obviously, you know, in the UK, it's Cantonese food that is the primary. Yes. Um, and there isn't actually that much Cantonese food in Myanmar, apart from we do like roast duck. So <laughs> there's like this, there's this chain of roast duck restaurants called Golden Duck and like everyone just goes crazy for it. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that we have assimilated, we've done it quite subtly. So it's not entirely obvious. Um, and, you know, it's the same with kind of other other kind of types of food. So like with Thai food, I think um, one of the things, so there, one of the kingdoms that was Um, one of the primary kingdoms for a long time was uh, Mon, the Mon kingdom. Now, the Mon kingdom, I think, historically have the same roots as a lot of people in Thailand. And so you will see dishes in in Myanmar and Burma, like Mohinga, which is our national dish, right? So this this national dish, well, I say national, there'll there'll be people who will barrack me and and complain. But basically, it, it is like a, it's a fish soup on rice noodles with herbs. That's at its heart. That's it. It's a fishy soup. Um, yes. And this is basically not that different from, I think it's called Namya in Thailand, um, yep. except they will primarily maybe put long beans and mint on it, whereas we will primarily put coriander. But it's basically the same dish. And that's because the dish has come from the Mon Kingdom. And so, so as I said, you know, it's like one of those things where if you go back, we've all got the same an- a common ancestor, right? So... Because, yeah. you know, this this ebb and flow has been happening for such a long time, there isn't, it's not quite so obvious that you can point at something and go, Indian, you know what I mean? So, oh, yes. Thai. <laughs> it is, it is. Yeah, is. I will tell you one thing, though. One thing that is very obviously stolen, I'm going to kill for this. But, you know, I said the breads, we've stolen all the breads, but the desserts <laughs> also tend to be stolen because we, we're, we're kind of one of those countries where, 
I think probably like fresh fruit is the thing that we have, but you yep. know, s- s- desserts aren't a, aren't a thing that you have at the end of the meal like many other countries. It is, you know, what you have a snack, you know, instead of ice cream, you might have a, like a bowl of something or you know, um, and basically most of our desserts I think are stolen from India and Malaysia. So <laughs> because, and I say why, it's because uh-huh. they. They're primarily coconut based. And um, Myanmar as a whole does not tend to use coconut in anything apart from desserts. And then and then all the desserts, if you have something in Burma, you will see like a, an, an analogous thing in either India or Malaysia. So this is my my theory. I'm not I haven't verified this in any way. But, <laughs> but just because a lot of the time I swear like the versions that you have in India and Malaysia just seem to be that much more kind of elaborate or refined or whatever. And I just think, yeah, we've just nicked this. We've just stolen this. To <laughs> I am glad that people uh, do uh, like you do say, oh, well, we nicked this and we did this. I'm a great <laughs> believer that, you know, Calcutta or India or blah, blah, they just stole it from everywhere. And, yeah. Uh, pe- yeah, and people kind of don't like to admit it. And I go, we all stole it from I'm this pr- place because they- yeah, there's nothing wrong with being a culinary magpie, especially when you know we don't have an oven culture, right? Myanmar does not have an oven culture. We have one cake, and even that cake was stolen. So, <laughs> so our, our our cake, and, and it's like a semolina cake, but it's basically suji kahalwa. You know, yeah. it is literally semolina pudding. We don't we, we we cook it on the stove, and if you've got an oven, which is rare, you will stick it in the oven. But yeah, it's just semolina pudding. So. <laughs> Which is a great, great point to uh, to go into food as protest. Uh, no, I think that's fantastic, and I think for people listening, that's a great description because I think, quite frankly, people don't know uh, Burmese, Myanmar food as they as they should do. And f- I will tell you, just from my visits there, it was just fantastic. From the restaurants we went to, to the little street stalls, to everywhere we went, it was. And we uh, we met with my a Filipino brother uh, who came along and it was the food and he's a big eater, a big eater. <laughs> and everywhere we went, he was trying things and we were trying things and the food was just magnificent. So you know, for me, it was just, I mean, you know, despite what's happened more recently, it was just a great, great trip for us. Um, what I'd like to do now, though, uh, let's because I wanted to talk to you about kind of food as protest, because that's mm-hmm. your thing. You are, you know, big into what's happening in, you know, Myanmar right now. You're talking about it. I think it's really important. It, you know, it is for me, and I read about it, you know, all the time. Um, so I, th- I just thought, just as a kind of finish to this, or we've got some fun questions coming later. Mm. Um, how, how food as protest, and by this I don't mean kind of flinging food like eggs, yeah. and yeah, and that that's kind of a waste for this but how food can be used as protest and i just really wanted to talk to you about that because you are so much in kind of in the thoughts of everyone on twitter and all of this and we'll talk about twitter later on you know you're so much in the thoughts of them so i I just thought you could be a great uh, person to describe this for me um so yeah and, and we do we talk about you know yogurt in ancient Greece and we talk about you know tomato well not tomatoes and eggs in those point but we uh, in ancient Rome but we use them in in ancient Rome with food and we use them you know more recently in um you know well since the 1600s with tomatoes and things but I really wanted to know how sorry how you thought the notion of food could be used around the world mm-hmm. um so and and i think i, I read so ad 63 when uh vespasian was hit by turnips in africa but I, you tell me how it, you think it's been used i mean i would say it's more like 50 bc this is just going on my entirely non my entirely non-classical background of having read uh asterix and oblix and uh do you remember the fishmonger <laughs> Great. But do you remember the fishmonger and hygienics? Uh, yeah. How 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 he would just like enter every fight by swallowing someone with a fish. So 50 <laughs> BC. That's my point. My start date. Um, okay. So if if I, if I may kind of like just explain a little bit about what's been happening in Myanmar. Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, fe- February 2021, uh, the army there decided to stage a coup. So it was the like the day before the newly elected, d- democratically elected government were meant to be sitting in parliament. They basically kidnapped 
the prime minister, the you know, cabinet members, threw them all into prison um, and declared martial law and just told the whole country that, no, they were in charge now, which is, you know, quite yes. you know unsettling um and so what happened was that the the uh, kind of little by little the entire country basically down tools um and started what uh, is being called the the cdm so civil disobedience movement um yeah. and so the idea was that they, they tr were trying to bring um the country to a halt uh, in protest and to get the, the the military to allow the government the civilian government to sit um, and so kind of one of the primary ways that you saw kind of food sort of as a protest, I think, is the whole kind of, and, and you know, an army marches on its stomach, right? That's the, the saying. Yes, um, absolutely. And, and so every day, like whole towns were going out and protesting and with their banners and, you know, calling out protests and holding their megaphones. And, you know, as important as these people kind of making waves with the people on the sidelines and the people on the sidelines were the people kind of pr providing the food parcels, the, the you know, the water. Um, and they were doing it at great risk themselves. So, like, you heard tales kind of every other day of people being arrested. So, like, there was quite famously a pickle lady. So a lady who had the, the most the most famous pickles in a town called, I think it was Monuar. Um, and every day when people were doing their sit-ins and their protests, she would go around with this, her huge kind of trays full of the best pickled plums and kind of limes. Mm. And, and and the way we have pickles is kind of like, it's fruits, right? So it's it pickled in like things like salt and paprika and licorice and sugar. And so, and, oh, and she beautiful. would... Yeah, exactly. And what she would do is she would hand these out to everybody to keep them going, right? Because, you know, the, it was giving them like little bursts of energy. And, you know, the, the RB threw her into prison because, you know, she was, you know, keeping these people going. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 so this was this kind of like an ongoing thing. But then kind of food started appearing as something, as, 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 as kind of a sign or a symbol of resistance in all sorts of ways. So we had this thing where, um, as well as kind of doing these demos in person, they were trying to encourage people in the diaspora, especially, but also all around the world, you know, whether you were Burmese or not, they were wanting people to join into with these campaigns. So we would have these things called the strikes and they would be these online visual representations. And so, you know, you mentioned eggs earlier. So we had something called the Easter egg strike. And now bear in mind that the, the population, the Christian population of Myanmar is pretty small. It doesn't matter, it was an excuse. And so what we would do is so that, you you know, we got eggs and we would paint them with democracy symbols and democracy slogans and then place them around where they would be found. And, you know, it was just it was almost like, you know, a, like a, a symbol to other people to show there is resistance. We are still kind of supporting each other. And so these eggs were being used kind of just like signs to what the, throughout the rest of the world, but also to show solidarity to the people within Myanmar, that people you know cared about them and knew what they were doing. Um, and then and then another thing that happened was that it was kind of called the onion protest. And what that was, was that there was um, some military, we, we, the, there was rumor that, that some army trucks were heading towards a particular part of Myanmar to basically kind of besiege the place. Um, and what happened was that the, the kind of, there was only one major road for them to get to, to get to this place. And that someone kind of got a truck of onions um, and they basically kind of, pulled down the back of the onion uh, onion truck and so onions were just rolling all around the road which meant that wow. no one could get through and then people just kind of ran onto the road and were like oh i've dropped my onions and so you saw these videos of people just very slowly counting and picking up their onions bit by bit and the thing is that like there have been demonstrations and coups and protests in Myanmar since like the 60s since like the first military dictatorship but because you know food was being employed in this way at first, at least, the military had no idea what to do because they were used to people being violent and then shooting on the protesters. But when people were just being irritating, you know, so they were just throwing onions in their way and throwing, you know, any like potatoes, whatever, they were literally just trying to annoy and inconvenience the military as much as they could. So, you know, that was how food was being used. Um, and then other things that we're doing. So I think I mentioned before that, you know, our desserts tended to tend to be kind of stolen. So they're all coconut based. So we, we, we have a, a new year dessert, which is called Molong Yebo. And that one is, um, 
it's like dumplings. So it's kind of rice flour based dumplings. Um, and in each of them, you put like a little piece of jaggery. Um, but like in it, like the sixth one, you would put chili. And the whole point was that you played a prank on your friends. So they wouldn't know which one they were getting. Right. Um, and so what happened New Year last year, but also the year before that, is that people were kind of making these dumplings, but like kind of symbolically putting chilies in all of them. Um, <laughs> And, and 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 they were also doing this thing where they um, were kind of, instead of making the traditional dumplings, they were forming them into like patterns, like huge slogans. So they'd have these vast bamboo trays and said so that you could take overhead shots. And they were, the, the, we have this symbol of resistance, which is the three fingers. So it's three fingers held up, right? Yes. And so yes. they were just using this dough to turn, to make these hand sized dumplings. Um, so, you know, food was kind of being used visually um, as, as well as being to kind of use as a source of sustenance for the people that were protesting. Um, and then I think the other most important way that food was used as protest is the rejection of food. And by rejection, I mean it in two different ways. So the first way, I guess, um, maybe more denial, what was happening was that a lot of the street vendors were um, kind of either openly or not so openly refusing to serve the military and the police. Um, and so what would happen is that if they saw, you know, the military coming by, they would start to pack up their shops, you know. So it was oh. kind of a, it was like a protest. It was like, I'm not going to feed you because you don't deserve it. Um, but then again, what happened in Mandalay was that there was one guy who was a bit too bold, I guess, because he literally put up a sign. He, he had like a he did pork sticks. So pork sticks are kind of like pork kebab type things that we have. Yes, I remember Mm. And he he <laughs> and he put up a sign which literally said, "If you are military or uh, police, I will not serve you." And so, of course, what happened was that the yobs came in and they trashed his stall. So you know that is a, a man's livelihood that was destroyed because he dared to openly say, "I will not feed you," right? Um, so that's the kind of the one way of kind of denial of food or the rejection of food. But then the other one, and I think this is a more kind of historic one, but also is being used to date, is is the use of um, hung, hunger strike, right? Yes. So rejection of food. So what we have in, uh, I mentioned before that Myanmar is like 80% Buddhist. Um, and one of the things that people do often on a daily basis is that they will give alms to monks. So what happens is that the monks will go by and with their alms bowls, their begging bowls, and, you know, you get merit. It's basically your way of, this is a bad thing to say, but it's kind of your way of being greased into heaven, right? Because the monk comes past and you, you serve them whatever you've cooked yes. for them every day. Yes. Yes. Um, and so the military in Myanmar, the police in Myanmar would have you believe that they are very religious and very upstanding. And one of the reasons they're doing this is it's nationalistic, but it's also a cultural and religious thing because, you know, the country is being ruined by the West and we are taking back control. It's that idea. Right. And so yes. for a lot of them, it's very important for them to like donate to temples and feed monks and all that kind of thing. So what was happening that a lot of monasteries around Myanmar, they were um, rejecting donations from the military and the police. Um, and the reason this oh. is particular, yeah. And the reason this is particularly pertinent in, in kind of like the idea of protest is that, so an arms bowl is called a debate, right? That's the word for our debate. Um, and what they were doing was that they were kind of symbolically kind of standing in front of their monasteries or going past like the, the troops with their arms bowls upside down, which means you can't give them food. So yeah. that's called that's called the bait mouth, which means an upturned arms bowl. But that has also, because this is something that Buddhist monks have done for a long time, depending on, you know, why they're rejecting it. The bait mouth also means I resist. So now even civilians, when they are kind of like on their marches, on their protests, they will do their chants. But as part of the chanting, they will regularly go, the bait, the bait, mao, mao, which means we turn over our arms bowl, we reject your offering, you're not going to heaven. Right? <laughs> so I did not know that. Um, I just want to, I mean, I want to, you know, I'm going to avoid some of my questions here, or not avoid them, because I think <laughs> this is just too interesting. Um, when you when you look at this, I mean, you talk about the men, but there's so many women who are in charge of the food and looking at this mm. particularly. And is that 
an area where women can go, we can be part of this, this is an important part of what we do as well, and they start going into this and they go, you know, we're in charge here, this is something that we can do. Is that something that is happening there? Because it, it strikes me as something really being a really important thing. Oh, definitely. I mean, like in, in Myanmar, I think the women have at least culturally been the ones wearing the trousers. I say wearing the trousers, but no one wears trousers. Like the women and the men, we, we, we wear sarongs. So, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, women um, have always been at the forefront of the revolution in, in, in Myanmar. Um, it's one of the reasons, so the, the, the military in Myanmar are very misogynistic, they're very paternalistic. Um, and one of the ways that they were trying to kind of take back control um, was try and make it more of a patriarchy. And so, you know, they've been drumming that into the country since the 60s, since before that. And, you know, it's it's something that people, it, it, you know, if you're a sexist, you're going to kind of buy into this whole everything else. And so what's been happening is that women have been sidelined. So even like in terms of kind of representation, even before the military took over, you know, there weren't very many women in politics in Myanmar, but historically there were, you know, so, you know, our first doctor was in the 1900s, female doctor, our first female, um, like, governor was in the 1900s. Um, and so what's been happening is that we were well on the way to be, you know, we we had, uh, what's it, the, the, um, um, the suffrage, female suffrage, we had yeah. that just after they had it here in the UK. So we were definitely on the right track. We were definitely on the right track. Um, and then it's just been set back by decades. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we've been seeing a lot of these protests are actually being led by women, whether or not they're food related. Um, I mean, like my my own family, my, gran my grandmother and my great aunts were the student protest leaders when there, were, there was unrest in the 30s and the 40s. So this is something that I think is in our blood, um, women kind of like getting out there. But it's been, you know, slightly less noticeable just because of the dictatorship. Um, and then, you know, you were saying about Suu Kyi, so Aung San Suu Kyi, when she kind of came to the forefront, that's when things started getting better again in terms of kind of feminism, in terms of people realizing that, that you know, the women should be in the forefront. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why people are protesting so hard now is because they, it's really noticeable what, what they've lost, you know? It's very noticeable that... There was a, a freedom, yes. there was democracy, even if it was always kind of on a leash because, you know, the military were always there in the background. Um, and now all of that's gone. Um, and so people are really angry, um, whether they're a woman or a man. <laughs> um, I I think this is a just a fabulous question. And I had loads of points going on about, you know, food in different parts of the world. But I think, quite frankly, you've talked about yeah, you know, I think you've connected it to Myanmar, and it's been brilliant. So I'm I'm not going to ask some of the other questions because I just think then basically they're not so much uh, to the point of what you're doing. Um, I think this has just been a brilliant uh, series of questions for you. Um, but what I want to do now, because we have yeah you know, we have about oh twelve minutes or or so, uh, I want to ask you some fun questions. Okay. If I and uh, hopefully they they will be fun, and then I just want you to talk about um, who you are and where they can find you on Instagram. Because I, I first of all, I do think you are absolutely just a, an amazing person to go and follow. You are because yes, you'll talk, you, you know you are you'll talk about your food and that's wonderful, but you will talk about this politics. You will pick up on you know all of this all the time. So. Um, so let's start anyway with some with some fun questions we'll have um well let's say i hope uh, they're fun if if mimi if mimi a was a meal what would it be now i hope um, it'll be burmese but but it, you can it tell is, me it is <laughs> <laughs> i hope so yeah i bloody hope so i'd be in trouble <laughs> if it wasn't um so yeah. it would it would be bogo miche which is you know i mentioned the noodle dish which i think originally yeah. came from yunnan um but basically the reason it would be that so that's a pork tamarind and garlic rice noodle dish um and the reason that i'd be that that would be me is because it's warming it's punchy it's it's a little bit sharp sometimes because of like the tamarind it's multi-textured and it's irresistible <laughs> <laughs> i have to say that is one of the best uh, responses i've ever had to this and i've asked lots of people over the years and Aww. we've asked 
we are yesterday was in fact the fourth uh, anniversary of having oh, done my globe. So, yeah, so we've done little oh, gosh, a hundred episodes or something now, and uh, 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 probably about a third of them are interviews, and the rest of me writing. You know, my kind of um, I'd want to say expose. So that's probably not the right word, uh, but I. Should I be but worried? I write, <laughs> Yeah, I know it's not exposés at all. Um, my little kind of essays on what we're we're talking about <laughs> that month, uh, but that is one of the best qu- uh, sort of questions um, I've ever had. That's brilliant. Uh, but th- no, that's fantastic. Now, if now, well, let's see if they carry on this way. <laughs> if you could select any sp- specific meal in history or any period in history, what would it be? Because I think this is a really interesting one. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I'm going to cheat and have two answers. Um, and my first, <laughs> my first, my first is semi-serious, and the second isn't remotely serious. Uh, so for my <laughs> semi-serious one, uh, this is purely based on a conversation I was having with friends. So I, I, I was visiting friends yesterday, and basically, we were talking about life expectancies and about things like the Paleolithic diet and how it's quite trendy and it's all hunting and scavenging and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so we, we decided to kind of look up the various diets and, you know, what the life expectancies were. And so, for example, for Paleolithic, it was like 22. So I'm not entirely sure where, how much the diet factors into that. Um, but, but then we were looking at all the different diets that, you know, we have record of. And interestingly, the one that came up top in terms of life expectancy, um, and we're talking like the eight, you know, in your 80s, was the medieval Islamic diet. Now, oh my gosh. I know nothing about the medieval Islamic diet, but I feel like I need to research it now because when everyone else was dying in their 20s and 30s, they were living till their 80s. So, <laughs> I, I mean, apart from, I think it must have some relation, not to the tomatoes and obviously stuff like that, or maybe some, <laughs> but it, uh, but it, I think they had a lot of almost like a European Medi- a Mediterranean diet. So ah. they used chickpeas, they used legumes, they used all of those things. And I think, I mean, they used a tiny bit of meat and they used a lot. So I think that's what it may be. And I have to go and do some research myself. <laughs> um, but what, what, was your, what was your second answer? My second answer, which isn't remotely serious and is actually <laughs> fictional, um, is and I seem to be obsessed with asterisks at the moment. So I would like to go to um, a, Gaul, a, a Gaulish, is that the word? Banquet as set in asterisks and obelix. And very specifically, I would like to eat a whole roast wild boar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that Obelix carried around with him on his whatever on Basically. his yeah well that would be fantastic. <laughs> so that's been, that's kind of been that's been my dream ever since I was a child, and I don't know how. No, I well, I've, it, I've so. been reading Asterix ever since I was a child too, and I think that would be a fantastic one. And I think <laughs> putting on my eat my globe uh, judging hat as I have here, um, I think that would be a, a perfect one to have. Oh, amazing. Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, that would be fantastic. I think that. And and for anyone who doesn't know Asterix and Obelix, they are um, cartoon characters from, I think, um, Gascony and I can't remember the under... I can't remember who they're G- all called. G- but they're- Gascony and Udazo, I think they were. Udazo, that was it. And they were from, I think, France in the kind of 60s and 70s, and they were just brilliant. And they tell... I mean... Their names in British are fantastic. They're brilliant, mm. and 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 in the US, I think they're all the same in uh, British countries and uh, American countries. So uh, do go and read them. They are fantastic books, and they will tell you um, a little bit about history. <laughs> um, but now, then, let's get on to um, what would you consider to be the greatest invention in food history? Mm. So I armed and armed about this for a long time and I was thinking about things like, ooh, kind of pickling or kind of dehydration or refrigeration. But then I thought, let's take it all the way back. Let's take it all the way back. I think the greatest invention is fire. Um, and the, the reason I think it's fire is because that's that's how we managed to render a lot of stuff edible that wasn't. Um, and that's how, you know, we started cooking really properly being able to set fire to things and cook them in some way. So. I think, on to be fair, on this uh, 
season of interviews that you're not the only no you are the only person to name fire and i will let you go where we did have someone about two seasons ago who named fire and that's great because you know if you believe it you can say that so i think that would be okay. fair we did have someone to mention we we had someone this season who did mention refrigeration and it wasn't the person who talked about reg, uh, refrigeration and ice which is fred hogg who talked about refrigeration and oh. he came on to talk about his book of ice and men but actually it was a woman who talked about um the uh, importance of kind of black food ways throughout american history and she talked about virginia and she was uh, amazing so i gave her that okay. um but i think no. i think okay we'll allow fire this time. normally i go fire and refrigeration and <laughs> they're like eh, you know because it's those ones but you are leaving because you've given you give us fantastic info me- about carry on I was going to say Prometheus got punished for it, so I won't say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is! I think that is brilliant. And just some final information then, because I think everybody should go and follow Mimi A. But what do you call Memly? Is that right? Memely, Memely, Memely. Yeah. So, how? <laughs> first of all, uh, why don't you tell everyone how A. How you spell that, yeah. and then B. How you go and you know. Do all of this on i mean are you on tiktok but <laughs> i am embarrassingly i am i'm way too old to be on tiktok but i am oh, well, um, hey, how, how do you think i am and i'm on there <laughs> and, and we do have a friend who is on here who has he's 65 and he has wow. eight hundred thousand <gasps> people amazing on, uh, he, he talks about weight loss and he's an, a surgeon oh. and he's brilliant and a very good friend of mine um so you know we have uh, we have people who don't know who you know do know how they're doing, uh, but uh, talk about Twitter, <laughs> yes. Instagram, Facebook, yes. TikTok, and yeah. Tell us about okay. Them. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so like Simon says, my name is Mimi A, but I go by the name Mimali, which is spelled M E E M A L E E. It's not a Burmese name; it's a name that a friend of mine gave me at university. And to be honest, it's it, if you're Burmese, it's a little bit of a rude name. So I'm not going <laughs> to say what it means. Um, but but just Burmese people do sometimes ask me why on earth I've chosen that name. And like I said, it's, I didn't choose it. Someone gave it to me. Um, and yes, I am very active on Twitter and Instagram. Sometimes they remember that Facebook exists, but you know, <laughs> I'm there. Yeah. I, 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 if you talk to me on Facebook, I'm there. Um, and on TikTok, I mainly use TikTok to kind of spy on my nieces and nephews and find out what's cool and trendy. And then I fail. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> But I am everywhere as the same name, Mimali. So, <laughs> which, which, yes, I guess not many people. I'm, I go on as Simon Majumda because everyone's going to find me on that because <laughs> there isn't another one. Um, I will. This has been so much fun. I will oh, tell you, this yeah. has been. It has been a. It's great to see you because uh, I don't. I don't get to. I kind of see your pictures on Twitter and all of those, and I don't get to know you very much. Um, your amazing stuff about you know the food in myanmar and where it came from and the protests in myanmar i think has been fantastic for me um i just want to say i want to say thank you very much for coming on eat my globe it's been a real real pleasure oh thank you uh, you know you, you you know this is such a huge honor I, I i'm i feel kind of embarrassed to be here because yeah. you know you you have such amazing people on but hopefully i can hold my own so no <laughs> thank yeah, you, you. You definitely, definitely have. I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Do make sure to check out the website associated with this podcast at www.eatmyglobe.com where we will be posting the transcripts from each episode along with all the references and resources we use putting the episodes together in case you want to delve deeper into each subject. There is also a contact button So please do let us know if there are any subjects that you would like us to cover. And if you like what you hear, please don't forget to subscribe, recommend us to your family and friends, and give us a good rating on your favorite podcast provider. That really makes a difference. Thank you, and goodbye from me, Simon Majumba. And we'll speak to you soon on the next episode of Eat My Globe, a podcast about things you didn't know you didn't know about food. The Eat My Globe podcast is a production of It's Not Much But It's Ours, 
and Producer Girl Productions. And is created with the...